Ready? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Central Christian. For those of you here in person and those of you online, uh, we're here to worship our Lord. And my name's Rob Love. I've got some announcements to start off with. So let's remember that this month, our prayer for the month is for our visitors. Um, I don't see any today, right now, but uh, let's just keep our visitors in our prayers. Uh, pray that God brings us visitors and pray that we're able to help them to feel welcome and at home. Um, also, let's remember last month, which was for the youth, uh, pray that God is preparing youth to come and, and that he will overflow our youth room with, with youth and that we can be a positive force in this community. Um, thank you all to those who worked JAMA this past week. We served 39 families, and also in conjunction with JAMA, we collected 126 boxes of mac and cheese. That'll serve us 63 families, so thank you so much for bringing in the food this month. Uh, John, do we know what food for next month is yet? To be, de to be determined, yeah. Yeah, how, how much are we supposed to bring, somebody said. A lot. All that you can bring. <laughs> um, next Sunday, after services, we're having our fifth Sunday potluck lunch. You know, we've switched that from having a breakfast to having a lunch after service. The elders and their wives are going to be bringing the main dish for a taco bar. So that'll include hard and soft taco shells, seasoned meat, seasoned chicken, lettuce, tomato, sour cream, and shredded cheese. Now, we're asking the rest of you to bring chips, salsa, black beans, Mexican corn, or any of your other favorite uh, dishes that go with tacos. Or, or not even that go with tacos, but also uh, anyone who wants to bring desserts, please feel free. Please, please. please yes, we're getting a lot of pleases on that. Uh, we still have plenty of yard signs. If you haven't gotten one yet, they're at the, they're at the front door and the side door. Uh, it's a great way to let people know that Central Christian is your church. And I've got to get a new one because mine's in bad shape. Um, Saturday, June 4th, the ladies are gathering for fellowship at 1 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And if you haven't let Mary Lou know that you're coming, please do so so she can plan accordingly. And then also Saturday, June 18th, we're going to have praise and worship on the lawn. Uh, that's from 5 to 7. So come and have a, uh, enjoy a wonderful time of Thanksgiving and worshiping our Lord, followed by a great time of fellowship. There will be hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill. Um, think about who you could invite who's not a member of our church. Uh, you could come and enjoy that. And are there any other announcements that we know of? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the seasons, the new life that's springing up. Lord, it all reminds us that you are in control and you are sovereign and that you are the creator of all. Lord, we pray that um, you would bless us through this week, bless us through this service, that we would uh, hear your word, take it to our hearts and, and apply it to our lives, Lord. Uh, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Uh, ask these things in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Let's sing praise to God. Let's sing this morning. I stand amazed in the presence. Never be. 
the shore and steady
so much for the anchor that you are that we can hold on to and we can trust and thank you so much for your love and your grace god i pray you'll be with us as we worship this morning we love you and we thank you pray this in your name amen it'd be time for children's worship My hope is we're holding on to the anchor. And I've said it before, and I'm sure I will say it again and again as long as we're here together in this building, that every one of us struggles over something. Every one of us has battles going on in our life that we sometimes wonder, are we just going to be swept overboard? Is the night going to envelop us and we're never going to find our way back to the light? And the light's always with us because it's Jesus. And so we need to hang on to that anchor. And we need to know that he is always there, steady for us. As we're wrapping up our study on apologetics, this morning's topic is the idea that the world views Christianity and frequently the accusation against us is, you're just so exclusive. You know, you think it's all about you. You think you're the only ones going to heaven. You think you're the only ones that have it right. You think you're the only ones that are ever going to get out of this world and get to a better place. What is it about Christianity that makes you so sure of where you are and what you know? And and why can't all these other faiths and religions be just as valid as yours? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. 
hoping again that as we go through this series that we're giving you some answers, giving you some things to say that as you encounter people that you talk to Jesus about, and they raise some of the objections that we've talked about through this sermon series, that you'll be able to say to them maybe something that you've heard from Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. As we believe in Christianity, and I'm presuming all of us do, or you wouldn't be here, that every one of you here today have an understanding or at least an acceptance of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that through our faith in Him, we can be assured of the hope that the Bible talks about that we will spend eternity with God forever. To do that, there are several things that we need to understand. The first is, of course, whether we believe what the Bible says. How many of you in here this morning believe what the Bible says? Do you believe all that it says? All right. You know, there's the challenge for us, isn't it? As we study God's Word, as we try to understand what the book says, to grasp the, the hope that it encompasses, to grasp the truth that's in it, so that we can argue, for lack of a better word, what God has to say about us, what He has to say about mankind, how we're supposed to view this world. And we live in a world where people look at Christianity and our claim that Christ is the only way to salvation, and they criticize us. It seems a little strange to me they don't criticize other religions. You know, most other faiths believe they're the only ones right. Look at what the Muslims are doing. They believe they're so right, they will kill you, many of them, if you disagree with what they believe. You look at the Hindus who believe they've got the whole understanding of the enlightenment from God, and if you don't accept what they believe, then you're somehow mistaken, and you're never going to arrive at where you want to get when your final spirit ends up where it's going to go. While they criticize Christianity over and over and over that we are so exclusive, they rarely mention that practically every other faith claims the same exclusivity, if that's the right word, but nobody complains about them much. You don't hear people arguing. Those crazy people from Islam, they think they're the only ones going to make it to Mecca. You know, those crazy Buddhists, they think they're the only ones who have the enlightenment. You don't ever hear those arguments. And I used to ask, why is that true? Why is Christianity the one that's criticized so much and all the other religions are sort of just a blind eye turned toward and sort of ignored? And it dawned on me one day, maybe... It's because we're right. And just saying that, of course, makes some people think, well, you obnoxious, arrogant jerk. But if you believe what the Bible says, there's nothing wrong with us saying we believe we're right. If you're ashamed of that, then I'm not sure you really do believe what the Bible says. And because we're the ones that we believe and know we are right, nobody criticizes the others. Because nobody really cares about the others. It's Christianity that professes to rule the world. It's Christianity that professes to have the enlightenment from God that's going to result in people's salvation and only Christianity. And so we get the rocks thrown at us. Jesus says you will be persecuted if you stand up for me. And the reason for that. We covered in Bible class this morning when we looked at John chapter 1. The light came into the world, and the world couldn't overcome it. But the world didn't want it. The world didn't like it. And in the sense of that word world, it's the human society that rejects God. John uses that quite well when we get to 1 John He describes quite well what the world means in his writings. And it's that structure that says there is no God, that Jesus isn't the Son of God. And so that world, when Jesus came to it and still does, says we reject the light. We don't want the light. We would rather be in darkness than have the light shine on us. And because Christianity says we have the true light, the rest of the world, which is darkness, does its best to put us out. If you've ever wondered why that's the case, that's why I believe. It's simply because the truth hurts. 
and the world doesn't want to hear it. But you've got to believe that the Bible means exactly what it says. Then we have to decide if we believe the Bible's God's word, we will decide to believe that it's true whether we like it or not. How many of us, and you don't have to raise your hands, have looked at scriptures in the Bible and said, you know, I know that's what it says, but I'm just going to ignore that for a while. That doesn't fit my plan for the day. That doesn't mesh with what I know I'm going to be doing over the weekend. So I'm just going to slide that part of God's word off the shelf for a while, and I'm just going to do what I want to do, and then next week I'll come back and pick the word back up and do the things I'm supposed to do. Church, when we do that, and I say we because I suspect we all do that, what we're really saying to God is, I believe the Bible's your word. There's just parts of it I just don't care to follow. There's just parts of it that just don't make sense. There's just parts that don't fit the 21st century. And so we're going to ignore those parts because you didn't really understand what the world was like way back there in the first century when the Bible was written. It's changed so much, God, that you're not able to adapt and so we're going to take portions of God's word and we're going to ignore those. And we're going to act like they don't apply anymore. When we do that, what we're really saying is we don't believe the Bible is the word of God. Because if we believed it was the word of God, we wouldn't be trying to change it. We wouldn't be trying to live around it. We wouldn't be trying to skirt it. Because we would understand what the Bible says and we would want to do what it says. Not that we'll ever do it perfectly. But we wouldn't intentionally say, I'm going to take this part of the Bible and just ignore it. And we live in a world today where many people who profess to be Christians are doing that. And they're setting up these straw houses claiming to be God's house while rejecting those parts of God's word they don't like and yet still professing to be followers of God. That is not someone who's following God. That's someone who's created their own religion and they've incorporated some of God's stuff in it, but it isn't God's religion if they are intentionally ignoring and misteaching what it says. And so not only do we accept this to be the word of God, but we accept that what it says means what it says. And we're not at freedom, at least without consequences, to reject what it says. That's a challenge for all of it. It's a challenge for me. I suggest it's a challenge for you as we read the Word of God and try to understand it and then apply it to our life over and over every single day. But there's a lot of objections to Christianity. And some of those objections come along like this. Aren't all religions basically the same? I mean, don't all roads really lead to heaven? Are you really trying to tell me that billions of non-Christian people are going to go to hell? God can't condemn those who haven't heard. Christianity can't be the only way. And we could probably give a bunch of other statements that you've heard from people who would argue with the idea that Christianity is exclusive. They've got all kinds of reasons for why it isn't exclusive. And when we read about the world today and we look at all the religions around us, there are a lot of people who are coming along basically saying, truth is what I want it to be. Right? I can make up my own truth. I can decide what is truth. And if I don't like your truth, I'll make up my own truth. And of course that follows far enough to say, I don't like God's truth, so I'll make up my own truth. What is truth? Was it Pilate that asked Jesus that? What is truth? When you think about what is truth, truth is based on objective findings. There isn't my truth and your truth and her truth and their truth. Truth is truth. And we either accept it as true or we reject it. But that doesn't change the fact that it's true. That's the struggle we in the world have. We seem to think our preferences can decide what's true and what isn't. How many like barbecue potato chips? 
How many liked Wave's crispy potato chips? The ones with the ridges. Which ones are the best? What are the best? Doritos. Doritos. Onion. Onion chips. Boy, I found some the other day, jalapeno and cheddar. Boy, they were good. They were delicious. And we could go around this room, I suggest, and probably almost every one of us will have a different flavor potato chip that we believe is the best potato chip you can eat. If Alex likes a particular kind of potato chip, does his decision make it truth for all of us? No, because it's an opinion, right? We need to understand there's a big difference between truth and opinion. Truth is, period. An opinion comes and goes. I used to love something that now I don't like. Well, my opinions have changed. John, bless his heart, is now eating food that he never in a million years thought he would eat before he married Heather. Because our taste buds change, and so our opinions, our preferences change as we go through life and encounter other things. But truth doesn't change, and the struggle we have is trying to distinguish between what is true and what is just my opinion. What kind of ice cream flavor do you like? We could argue about that forever. Some of you people in here believe in its faults, but you believe it that peanut butter and chocolate go together as a dessert. No, see, that's, that's, that's a devil talking. See, that's an opinion. I don't like peanut butter and chocolate together. Give me a peanut butter and banana. You know, I'll eat that all day long. But these preferences and opinions and people just argue over which one's the best and which one do I want and which one will I buy. But they're all just matters of preference. They're not truth. And yet so many people believe religions the same way. My preference today is that religion. My preference tomorrow will might be something totally different. But it doesn't really matter because it's just my preference and my preference is just as valid as yours when it comes to what I want to believe. And so we're caught up in a world that has so glamorized human rights that we've expanded that idea into, I can even believe what I want to about God. You can believe what you want to about God. Doesn't really matter because we're all going to the same place anyway. Sadly, we're not. And we're not all going to the same place anyway because there is a truth. Some things simply cannot be true because they state conflicting claims. There is a God. Some people would say there is no God. Both of those cannot be true. There either is or isn't. Now you can choose which one of those you want to believe, but you can't choose both because they are opposite. One says the Bible is God's revelation to man. Other people will say the Bible's not that. It's just a bunch of stories made up by a bunch of old fat Jewish men. That can't be both. It either is the God's word or it's not God's word. Jesus is either God or he's not. It can't be both. You either accept he is or you don't accept that he is. You can't waffle between the two and say, well, maybe he is sometimes and maybe he's not other times. He either is or he isn't. And we either trust Jesus Christ for our salvation or we don't trust Jesus Christ for our salvation. One is true, one's not. Either we're saved through Jesus or we're not saved through Jesus. The Bible makes certain claims that if we're going to believe the Bible's the word of God, we accept what it says. Jesus says, I'm the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Who does that leave out? Nobody, right, Margaret? Leaves nobody out. No one comes to the Father except through me. There isn't an escape clause that says, unless you believe in Islam, or unless you're Buddhist, or unless you're whatever. That isn't in the Bible anywhere. Jesus says, you only get to God through me. That's why Christianity believes Christianity is exclusive. 
because we believe the Bible is God's word. And as John preached to us several weeks ago about proving how we can believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, we either accept it or we don't. And if we accept it, then we accept what Jesus says. I'm the only way to the Father. So be real careful when you're out in the world and you're talking to people who aren't Christians and they say to you, are you really suggesting I'm going to hell because I don't believe in your Jesus? Church, you need to be bold enough to say that's exactly what the Bible says. But if you waffle on that, and if you say something like, well, you know, that's God's choice. God's going to decide who's going to be saved and who isn't. I, you know, I'm not going to say that. You're a coward. You're not bold enough to say what the Bible says. Now, I'm not suggesting we start a bunch of arguments and go out of our way to embarrass and slap people and, you know, disparage them somehow. But when you get faced with a flat out, are you really telling me that I've got to believe in Jesus to go to heaven? I would hope every single one of us in this room would say that's exactly what the Bible says. You don't have to say that's exactly what I say. You need to say that's exactly what the Bible says. And if you're afraid to say that, you're doing a disservice to the people you're talking to. Because you're giving them some hope. Oh, well, Bob didn't say I really have to believe in Jesus. He said, well, that's one of those things that we have to decide. So I'm going to decide I don't. You need to be honest and love people enough when you get confronted with that question to tell them that. Peter says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I don't know how much more exclusive you can get. The Bible, the Word of God says, putting your faith and trust in Jesus is exclusive if you want to get to heaven. You either trust Him or you don't get there. The Bible makes a lot of claims. It makes some absolute claims on what is truth. And it says you either accept Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven by Him or you're not saved. That exclusiveness says that forgiveness of sin is found only in Jesus Christ. And so don't be afraid to say that because the inverse of that is also true. If you're not in Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Can't have it either way. If the Bible says only in Jesus are your sins forgiven. You can't say, well, I'm not in Jesus, but my sins are forgiven. You can't have both truths. It's either one or the other. And if we believe the Bible is the word of God and means what it says, then you cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. And what you believe really doesn't change facts. How many of you ever really believed in something only to be proven later that what you believed in wasn't true? You just put all your faith and hope in something, I'm not talking religiously, but some other thing. And, and you relied on something and you just planned all around it. And then what you really believed in turned out not to be right. Valerie had a beauty pageant that she was running yesterday. And she signed up judges to come judge that. And she gets there yesterday and one of the judges hasn't shown up and it's about 10 minutes after the pageant was supposed to begin, and so Valerie got a hold of that judge, and that judge said, oh, it was today. I wrote it down for the 22nd. Well, guess what? She may have believed it was the 22nd, but it wasn't. It was the 21st. She could have believed all she wanted to, that I really believed it was on the 22nd. Sorry, it wasn't. It was the 21st, and you believing it was on the 22nd doesn't change anything. You ever missed a doctor's appointment or some other appointment schedule that you had? Oh, I thought that was tomorrow. You thinking that doesn't change the facts. But boy, we try to do that with religion all the time. I think anybody who believes in something positive can be saved. As long as you do more good stuff than bad, certainly you're going to go to heaven. That's what I believe. I don't believe that, okay? But believing that doesn't make it so. And there are a whole lot of sincere people in this world who believe a lie. They're just as sincere as they can be. You can believe what you want to, but it doesn't change the facts. 
An example I read while I was putting this sermon together was some guy who said, yeah, anybody in here ever going scuba diving? Anybody? Dennis? What if you're on the boat getting ready to go scuba diving and somebody's got your oxygen tank sitting there and you say, you know, I believe carbon dioxide would work just as well. Or I believe helium would be nice to breathe while I'm down there. You can believe all you want, but it doesn't change the fact if you don't have oxygen in your tank, you're in big trouble. And the same is true with our faith in God. You can put whatever faith you want out there, but if it doesn't agree with the facts found in Scripture, your belief's not going to do you any good. We also need to understand that the trust that we put in something's only as good as what we're putting our trust in. Right? Ever walked across something that you were absolutely sure was going to hold you up and it cracked? You ever wanted to hang a picture and you said, well, this nail will work, and you put it in there and you hang the picture, down to the floor it goes. You put your trust in something, you want to believe that what you're putting your trust in is worthy of the trust you're giving it. We need to put our trust in Jesus Christ, not in some other man's opinion, some woman's opinion, my own opinion. It needs to be put in Jesus Christ. When Lazarus had died and Jesus shows up to heal him, he says to one of the sisters, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, we can believe all kinds of stuff. We can put our trust in all kinds of things. But if what we put our trust in isn't worthy of our trust, we've been waylaid. And we have famous, important people telling us, it doesn't matter what you believe. I don't know how many of you watch Oprah. But her gospel says it doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe whatever you want. We're all going to the same place. That's what Obama said while he was on the campaign trail many years ago. We're all going to the same place. We're just on different roads. Guess what? I'm not on the same road he's on if that's what he believes. Because he's not going where I'm going if that's what he believes. We need to take what the Bible says and believe it. We need to understand that there's all kinds of religions out there that say all kinds of stuff about who God is and who He isn't. Them saying it doesn't make it so. The Bible says God is a triune being who created this universe. Christian scientists say God is some impersonal force that's just some being out there in the middle of of who knows what. The Bible says Jesus is the divine Messiah. The Jehovah Witnesses say Jesus is Michael the Archangel, created by God. That's another of those statements that both cannot be true. Either Jesus is the divine Savior or he's Michael the Archangel. Which one is he? You can't have it both ways. Paul wrote it like this when he was being challenged by what are we going to believe. He says in chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, these rules, and he's talking at that moment Old Testament rules, but the same thing applies to any faith you want to look at. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Here's the key that people get fooled by. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul says there are things you're going to hear out there that people claim to be religion that are made-made wisdom, man-made wisdom, and they sound good. And you know, people you talk to about the faith they have, if you listen to someone who's truly sincere about what they believe, what they say sounds good to them. Makes all the sense in the world to them. Paul says those man-made religions have no value. Different religions make conflicting assertions about Jesus' work. The Bible says it was the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus that atoned for our sins. Islam says Jesus not only was not crucified, he didn't rise from the dead either. You can't have both. It's either one or the other. 
Salvation, the Bible says, it's saved by faith in Jesus' finished work. Hinduism says, if you just get enough good karma, if you just do enough good things, ultimately you will be reincarnated enough times to where you will just join in essence with the spiritual realm. I've always wondered, and I don't say this to embarrass or disparage Hinduism, if you lived a bad life and you come back as a frog, what's the difference in a good frog and a bad frog to make that frog's next life be better? I, I've never figured that one out. See, but that's one of those fallacies with Hinduism that believe the way you live now depends on what you come back reincarnated as and you want to do well so you keep getting better and better and better so that ultimately you don't come back and you join the spiritual realm. It can't be both. Look at this picture on this slide. I thought about making a box and wrapping it up and bringing it here and showing it to you, but then I thought the slide works just as well. But I've taken something, and some of you know me and others of you know me better, and I put something in that box. What did I put in the box? Something from my garage, Debbie says. No, oh, nothing from my garage. Yeah, I can't get rid of garage stuff. What do you think I've got in the box? The Bible would be a good guess. What? Air would be a good guess. But I didn't put the air in it. It was already there. What else? What would be in the box? We could guess all day, couldn't we? You have no idea what I put in the box. I put a hole punch. Just because that's what I wanted to put in the box. And you think, what's the point of that? The point of that is some people will look at religion that way and say, what kind of religion do I want? And I'm just going to guess at what God wants me to do. And I have no clue what it really is God demands of me, but I'm going to guess it's this, and I'm just going to presume it's that, and I'm just going to think, well, if I were God, here's what I'd put in the box. And so they come up with all these ideas of what does religion look like? The only way you would know without me telling you what was in the box would be for me to open the box and reveal it to you, right? See, we believe God has done that to us through his word. He's opened the box and revealed to us what he wants us to know. And we can look at that and say, okay, I'll accept that. Or we can look at that and say, why would anybody be so dumb as to put that in the box? That makes no sense. And then, of course, the challenge then becomes, who is God that he gets to tell me what to do? You ever had anybody say that? Who does God think he is? Why does he think he can control me? See, some people have come up with the idea that God can't direct my ways. He can't tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do. And in a sense, that's true. Until one day when it's time to pay the piper, as we say. And then we get to find out that God gets to tell us what to say. We need to focus, church, on the gift of grace. We have a God who looked at us and said, you don't deserve to be saved. Have you ever thought about that about yourself? You don't deserve to be saved. See, the question we get asked so often is, why doesn't God just save everybody? And there are some Christian people who teach that God's going to save everybody. Nobody's going to hell because God is love, and you just put your faith in something, and everybody's going to go to heaven. That is not what the Bible says. The correct question isn't, why doesn't God just save everybody? The question is, why does God save anybody? Why does God want us to spend eternity with him? Look at your own life. Don't look around you at all the other evil, nasty people who you can think about. Look at your own life. And ask yourself, why would the God who created all of this want to spend eternity with me? That's the question. And when you look at it that way, his grace that allows us to be saved becomes that much more overwhelming. Because he does want to spend eternity with you. He loves you so much that he wants you. 
You know, I got an object lesson yesterday from my 10-year-old granddaughter. We were at her birthday party yesterday. We would have had a busy day. They'd had that pageant Saturday morning. It was 90 degrees outside. We're in this gymnasium. Well, it feels like it's 110. And then they have to go outside on the stage and do all the stuff they're going to do. And then we go to this birthday party tomorrow, yesterday afternoon. It's hot, still hot. And they were all playing, going crazy, kids shooting everybody with guns. I mean, they've got these Nerf guns, everybody getting killed. And the rest of us adults are trying to eat because we like to eat. And Brooklyn came up to me and she said, Papa, could we just go outside for a while? And I said, yeah, what do you want to go outside for? She said, because I am so hot and tired, I'm about to get grumpy. <laughs> she said, I just need to go outside. Could we just go outside for a while? And we went out, and it wasn't raining at the moment. And we went out, and there was a swing set outside. And I just went out, and I pushed her on the swing set for a while. And when she was finally done with that, we were getting ready to go back in. She says, you know, Papa, they were going to go. They spent the night camping last night. She says, I think I'll be grumpy tonight. <laughs> and I said, Brooklyn, don't be grumpy tonight. You're going to be with Haley and your mom and dad. You're going to be camping out. Don't, don't be grumpy tonight. And she says, well, OK, Papa, I'll try not to be grumpy tonight. She was smart enough to know that she needed to get out of that party room with all the hustle and bustle and screaming and yelling and crazy people and get it by herself for a while so that she could relax. And I thought, boy, isn't that the way we have to act sometimes? We get so caught up in this world. We sing that song about God and, and how life just goes, and, and there's all these trials, and the night gets dark, and things don't work out the way we want to, and, and we get so caught up, and the world just keeps running and running and running and running, and before you know it, we're just ready to blow up unless we can just get outside a minute and sit down and sit with Jesus and relax and let him calm us down a little bit. So the world doesn't control us and we don't get so caught up. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, that God has shown the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. Church, that's why we trust our God. Because he's going to give us salvation when we come to him through Jesus Christ. Yeah, but what about all those people who have never heard about Jesus? You know, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know everything. When I was a lawyer, I knew everything. That's just the way lawyers are. They know everything. Now that I'm not practicing law anymore, are there are things I don't mind saying. I don't know the answer to this. And I don't know what God's going to do with those people. Where, John? Out of Mongolia, right? Out of Mongolia who never have a chance to hear about Jesus. I don't know what God's got in store for them. But I do know this. If the Bible means what it says, those who have a chance to hear about Jesus and who reject him after doing so are in big trouble. That's the first thing I know. So when people ask me, well, what about all those people who never hear about Jesus? My response is not, uh -huh, which could be my response. But my response instead is, they don't have anything to do with our conversation. That isn't you. You have heard about Jesus. You can scream all you want to about how unfair it might seem to those people who never hear about Jesus and what God's going to do about them, but that's not you. You've heard about Jesus, so worrying about people who haven't doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Your choice is, do you accept Jesus or not? And now they've got to make that choice. They don't get to stand before God someday and say, but I never knew. But I believe I've got a God who's fair and just. And I believe he's got a plan for those people that never hear about Jesus. I don't know what it is. I do know this. He's given you and me the obligation to share the gospel. Jesus, before he went back to heaven, told his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And through the ages, that command goes to us. Our task is to share the gospel with people. 
so that if the message is you don't accept Jesus, you're lost, even if you never heard about him, we're giving people an opportunity to hear. I'm so thankful Central Christian Church supports missions around the world as well as locally so that people can hear about Jesus who might otherwise never have had a chance to have heard about Jesus. There are a lot of questions I can't answer for sure. But I do know we have a God who loves us. And I do know we have a God that if we'll put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he will save us and we can live with him forever. One last passage, then we're done. Luke chapter 14, if you remember the parable of the, the banquet feast, the people who were invited didn't show up. In the story, that meant the Jews. The Jews rejected Jesus. And so the master told his servants, go out and ask everybody else to come. And the slave comes back and says, sir, what you've ordered has been done, but there's still room here. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. God says, I want everybody to have a chance to come. And we get to Revelation chapter 7. It says, and I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. People from every nation every tribe, every ethnic group, standing with God, saved. That's our challenge, is to share the message with this world about Jesus. I believe Christianity is exclusive. It's the only religion that will get you right with God. It's the only faith you can have that's going to matter when you stand before God one day and try to get in. Faith in Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be defensive. Be proud that God loves you. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for preparing for us a way that we could come to know Jesus and through him, you. God, help us to be bold enough to study the Bible, to learn what it says, and then to proclaim it to others. Thank you that someone has proclaimed it to us in our lifetime so that we can stand forgiven before you. Thank you, God, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have that anchor that we sang about. Maybe you need to hold on to it tighter. Maybe the storms are knocking you all over the place and you're getting banged around and you're thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. Hang on to the anchor. We're going to sing an invitation song. Bob will be up here to take your responses. If you've got a prayer request, you've got some needs, we'll listen to those, we'll pray with you, we'll rejoice with you, whatever you'd like to share. Come forward and share it while we stand and sing.
be seated. Will you pray with me? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Kyle Shell. He's doing pretty good. Uh, still, still going through uh, PT, but talk to him this week. Let's pray. Father God, we we do love you, Lord, and and uh, we we come to you right now, and God, we give praise to your name. Lord, we believe that you answer prayer, answer prayers. We believe that, God, you, you bless us in our lives. God, we thank you for all the blessings that we've had in the past, Lord, and we look forward to uh, enjoying those in the future. And, God, I pray that you'd help us to open our eyes so that we can see the blessings, like a granddaughter talking to you and, and, and tell you what's on her heart or uh, a friend sharing uh, a deep, uh, a deep need, Lord, uh, and for these prayers that we come to you with this morning. God, uh, J.W. Hartsuk has uh, been going through a battle. Uh, he's struggling right now, Lord. Um, they can't keep the, get the feeding tube to work, and uh, tomorrow the family has some uh, big decisions to make, Lord. So I pray that you'd be with J.W., be with his wife, be with Patsy and, the, and her sister, and be with the whole family, Lord, and, and God, just uh, give them the strength that they need to uh, to know uh, that to know that that what Bob talked about this morning is true. God, he's going to heaven. He believes in you. He knows you. He knows that you are the tr uh, way and the truth and the life. And he's asked you to be his Lord and Savior. So, God, uh, in the midst of, of all of the struggle that he's going through, Lord, I pray that the family would also look to the joy that may be coming uh, very soon for him. God, we love Patsy, and we just ask, Lord, that you would just give her special comfort uh, from us, Lord, and from you. Uh, and we pray for that. God, Mike North, Northmore is, is also going through a physical battle right now. He had surgery uh, this week, and, and God, they were able to correct some of the problems, but he's still got a lot of problems, Lord. And, and so we lift him up and ask, Father, that, that he would uh, just, that you would strengthen his faith. Holy Spirit, work in his life. Touch his body, Lord. Touch him and, and uh, touch his spirit. And uh, I pray that he would know. Like I said, you are the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. And Mike, if you're listening, I pray that God would uh, be with you right now and that he would comfort and give you peace and strengthen your body and touch and heal you. God, be with Susie. It's, uh, it's, it's been tough on her and give her uh, strength to endure uh, this and, and be with John and, and uh, Heather and the rest of the family, Lord, and, and may they just come together and hold on to each other in this difficult time. Father Alex has uh, asked for prayers for Trace and Allison Foster. They have uh, they live in Goodlettsville, uh, Tennessee right now, and they've had some house issues, and, and uh, Lord, they're, they're going to try to sell their house and move uh, back to this area. So God, we pray that you'd be in there uh, in the 
middle of, of their situation and help them through it, Lord. God, just uh, thank you for Alex and his friendship and uh, that, uh, that he can put his trust in you to answer this prayer. Lord, Donnie, Donnie has three unspoken uh, prayers. God, uh, you know what they are. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, just rest upon Donnie this morning, that you would be with him in the midst of these three situations, whatever they might be. And, and God, give him strength, give him uh, the ability to make uh, the right decisions if decisions need to be made. Uh, God, be, be with him and just give him comfort and peace. And, and I pray that uh, he would just turn to you, especially right now, for the guidance that he needs uh, in these situations. Lord, Eva uh, has come, and, and God, she's been struggling lately, and, and uh, she's still in pain. So, for, Father, we ask that you would just continue to be with her and, and comfort her in the midst of her pain. Give her strength. Give her uh, comfort. Uh, I pray that you would just uh, meet the needs that she has, uh, whatever, uh, if there's any special needs that she has. Lord, we give them to you and ask that you would intercede on her behalf. Father, we lift up the jail ministry. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for finally allowing uh, uh, Brad and Todd and, and the others, uh, uh, Laura and, and anyone else that's involved in the uh, jail ministry, to Marlene, I think, is one of them, to, to go back in to the men and women uh, in jail. Father, I pray for those, uh, those souls that you would uh, be with them. There are many needs that they have, God, uh, but the biggest need they have is you. So many of them ask that, that, we, uh, that we pray for their families. So, God, we lift up their families and ask that you would uh, be with them and give them protection and give them uh, hope and give them peace. And, uh, and, God, I pray that they would come to know you. And, and uh, I understand one of them is about ready to be, uh, to be let out. And, and I pray, Father, that, that he would find a church. And that he would be uh, welcomed into that church, Lord. If it's if it's around here, God, we welcome him to come join us. And and Father, I just thank you for Brad and and, and Todd and and Laura and Marlene and, and the message that they bring to these people who are in jail. God, we lift up Kyle Shell and ask, Lord, that that you would be with him uh, in in his re rehab. Uh, Father, uh, you know it's painful what he's going through, but it's. Uh, He's hoping to be out uh, by Tuesday, and so, Lord, I pray that uh, I know he's working extra hard to uh, try to get out of there. And so, God, just continue to be with him in the healing process and the, the, in the exercise and rehab process, and, and that he would be able to get out of that rehab center very soon, we pray, Lord, in, in Jesus' name. And, God, we also uh, lift, lift up Tony Gav Cavender. Uh, he has a torn rot rotator cuff. He's going to have surgery in June. God, be with him and the pain that he's going through. Uh, and uh, we just thank you for what you're going to do in the healing process for Tony. Uh, Father, uh, and that one was from Debbie. Uh, and uh, Veronica asked that we uh, lift up Charvis, who's having surgery on Wednesday the 25th. Uh, she is... Uh, I don't know what the surgery is, Lord, but I pray that you be with her and, and God guide the guide the surgeons as they operate on her and give her uh, body strength that she could uh, get through it and uh, re recover very quickly, Lord, we pray. Uh, Bob is having some medical issues, and we'll get to that in just a moment, Lord. Um, and, and then uh, Veronica and Debbie and the girls uh, are going out of town, I guess, this coming weekend. So God, just keep them safe, we pray. And uh, I pray that their, uh, their trip would be uh, very good and very uh, positive and, and that they would have fun and get done what they're, uh, they're aimed to do. Father, uh, Stephanie ha uh, has come up and asked that we uh, pray for Mrs. Crow. She's a JMS teacher. She, had a, she was in a car accident and told her, totaled her car. She's got a broken arm and some other minor issues. So be with her as, as she recovers from that accident, Lord. I pray that the, the whole process would, uh, would go favorably for her, that uh, as she deals with insurance companies and all of that, that uh, that would work out. She says that hospice will start Monday for her sister, Delane. She is in a lot of pain, 
and is vomiting almost nonstop. Pray for some relief for her. So, God, I, we lift up Elaine, Delaine, I'm sorry, Delaine to you, Lord. God, um, she's, uh, she's experiencing a lot of pain, and, and God, we just ask that you would ease that pain for her, that you would touch her body, Lord, and give her, give her comfort and peace. And, and Lord, if it's your will, uh, I pray that you would uh, bring her to be with you. If it's not, Lord, I pray for healing. Thank you for Stephanie, and, and God, just uh, be with her as she is, uh, is struggling with this as well. And, and so, Lord, we just give, uh, give Delaine to you and, and ask that you would uh, just be with her and her entire family, Lord. God, we give all of these things to you uh, in your name, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, because that's who we, uh, we have our faith in. As Bob said, it's by grace that we are saved through faith. And, Lord, we have faith, and we, we turn to you and, and, uh, and ask for uh, special guidance and, and healing and comfort and peace and, and all of these uh, prayer requests, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning um, we have a special, uh, special time. Uh, Bob is going through some uh, medical issues right now that he has not shared with uh, very many people. He just shared it with the elders this week and asked that we, uh, that we anoint him with oil. And uh, I'm going to ask the elders to come up. And Bob, if you will sit down there and uh, we, will, uh, we will work on this. Um, the Bible... The Bible teaches us when you just surround him. There's a mic right there. Uh, the Bible teaches in James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Then that person should send for the elders of the church to pray over them. They should ask the elders to anoint them with the olive oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered by those who have faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will heal them. If they have given, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. You know, this is something that is available to everyone, uh, all of our members here at Central Christian Church. It's a special, uh, special time, and uh, it's not it's not the anointing. It's not the elders being up here. It's the faith. It's the faith of of the person who's asked to be uh, prayed for. And it's the faith that we show in God towards, uh, t uh, for that person to be healed that is what actually does the healing. So if you, if you uh, have something going on in your life, if you have uh, an illness, if you have uh, an emotional issue that you just can't seem to get rid of, uh, please feel free to come forward or to get, get with one of the elders and, and we can do it in private, we can do it publicly, it's up to you. But I, I appreciate Bob's example this morning. He's got uh, he, he, some issues with his heart. He ha you know, because he had uh, Agent Orange exposure, he's, got, uh, he's, a, he's in renal failure, so he's got some kidney problems. He's got prostate issues right now, and that's all kind of coming to the head. Uh, for him, and, and so uh, we're, this morning, we're going to lift him up in prayer and, and trust that God will do the healing, uh, and we're just going to be obedient and come to him in prayer. So will you pray with me? Bow your heads and, and pray, and, and uh, Bob here. Let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, we lift our friend Bob Roberson to you. God, we ask that you would uh, touch his body. Lord, um, we know that he has faith in you, and we know that he's going to be with you in heaven sometime. And if it's your will, God, we ask that your will be done in his life. But Lord, we also ask that uh, you would touch him and heal him if it's your will. And, and God, we're coming to you this morning, and, and uh, we're putting him before the congregation. We're putting him before you, and we're asking you, Lord, that, that you would do a special, special healing of his body, Lord. 
God, we don't want him to go yet. We're being selfish. I'm being selfish. God, uh, he's been in my year, uh, life for like 16 years now, and I'd like another another 16 if I could get it, Lord. Uh, so, God, I, I lift him up to you and ask, Lord, that, that, uh, that you would just touch him, heal him, give him comfort. God, give him peace that, that he, I know he knows that you, you are God, and I know that he knows that you can heal him. And I know that he knows that if you choose not to heal him, he's going to be better off than all of us already anyway. But, but God, we just ask that, that you would just do a special healing, Bob. Touch his body, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Dear Father God, I echo Bob's prayer, Lord. Lord, Bob has been in service to this congregation for, for many years, Lord, and, and he loves you. He loves his congregation. He loves his family, Lord. And Lord, I pray, and I know you are able to heal him, Lord. Your miracles are still going on in today's world, Lord. I've seen them. We echo them. We acknowledge them, Lord. Well, I just pray that you will work through the doctors that he has uh, working with him, the appointments coming up, Lord. And I would pray that the next appointment he goes to, that the conditions will be extremely better, Lord. Yes. And then Bob could answer would be to you, to the doctor, that God's healed me. What a amount of a testimony would that be, Lord? Yes, Lord. To a world that may not believe you, to the doctors that may not believe in your miraculous power. But Lord, we trust you. We put our faith in your son. And you know what's best. And I pray for your will to be done, Lord. And I love Bob. He's more than just a pastor to me. He's more than a preacher. He's a friend. He's yes. family, Lord. And I come humbly at your feet to ask you that you do a miraculous healing on him, Lord. That you will remove the issues in his body, Lord. And although I've not had the 16 years of pleasure to be around Bob, I've had seven. And Lord, I'd like for another 27, Lord. I just pray your will be done in his life. I pray that you will comfort him. I pray you give him peace above all understanding like you say you will, Lord. We know you never leave us nor forsake us, God. And I pray this for Bob, Lord. But I also pray it for our congregation, that we would trust in you that we put our faith in you. I pray this for Debbie and Veronica and Valerie and Stephen and Haley in Brooklyn, that I know they're concerned. I know they're worried, Lord. We're concerned. Help us trust you. Give the doctors guidance in, in, in going forward and different ideas of treatments and, and suggestions, Lord. I pray that you'll give them mighty wisdom, Lord. But again, Lord, I do pray for a miraculous, a miraculous healing that they wouldn't need that wisdom right now. We give you all the glory, all the praise for everything you do in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, your servant, Bob, has demonstrated his faith many times. He stepped out from his former life as a lawyer and, and became a minister because you were leading him to do that, Lord. And he stepped out in faith on that, Lord. His faith now is that you will take care of him in whatever form that is. I know he, he trusts that your will will be done, but like Bob said, we're, we're selfish. We want him to be with us longer here on earth, Lord. We know we'll be with him again at some point in time in the future, but we would like to be with him here too, Lord. I ask for your comfort, your grace, your healing, your mercy on Bob. Lord, bring all that to you his family as well, as, and, and to our family, our church family, as we uh, await to hear what, what's next, Lord. Lord, I know, I know you are the great physician. We just ask for your healing here. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, we thank you for sending Bob Roberson to us. He has brought much in the Bible that we did not know, and he's presented it well, and allows us to learn things that we should be doing, and we appreciate that. 
We also thank you for he and his family, <clears throat> that they're a good family. And he has done well in this church to reach out to people, to save them, and to help them in their lives and so on. And we do appreciate with everything that happens to us. But he has begun a good one, and we ask for the help care for him to help uh, the doctors to solve the problems that he has and so on. And we know that you will do that in terms of your guidance and so on. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that. And as Bob said, that's something the Bible says we can do. If you're sick, call for the elders and let them anoint you with oil and pray over you. And we just trust God to do that. So don't ever be afraid to call and ask the elders. Let me clarify one thing in case the prayer has made you think something different. As far as I know, I'm not on death's door. Um, okay. <laughs> I have not had a diagnosis that I'm going to be leaving you anytime soon, although none of us have an assurance of when that might be. But uh, they found some heart palpitations and issues um, in my chest when I went to the doctor this last week. And then, as Bob said, because I was in Vietnam and got exposed to Agent Orange, I have several complications from that. Some of my blood work is not going the way they wanted to, so I'm going to have a biopsy in June just to see if there's anything that needs to be treated there. So uh, I'm not about to leave you, as far as I know. <laughs> but again, nobody knows for sure when that might happen. So, But I appreciate your prayers, guys. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and we think here and talk about our illnesses, our health, our problems. Can you imagine being born and knowing that your ultimate life was going to be crucifixion? that you go to help somebody, your whole plan is to help someone through with their needs, and all they're going to do is not only reject you, but they're going to kill you. And they're not going to give you a nice lethal injection and make it all as humane as possible. In fact, they're going to choose one of the most cruel ways this earth has ever devised to kill somebody. They're going to crucify you and let you hang there and die. That's Jesus, of course. We sing a song, I don't know if we've ever sung it here, but the song that says, He left the splendors of heaven, knowing his destiny. Could you imagine? Paul says, scarcely for a righteous man would one choose to die. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loves us. Knowing most of the world would reject him, Knowing most of the world would look at, like we talked about this morning, would look at Christianity and think, I don't want anything to do with that. He still came and died. And we remember that, hopefully not just on Sunday. But we do it on Sunday as we partake this juice and eat this bread to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. My hope is that this isn't the only time during the week you remember what Christ did for you. That you remember it frequently. And you praise God because of his love for us. I don't believe we have any new people here today, but we'll practice our communion the way we do. We'll come down the center aisle, take the double cup, and then go back the outside aisle to your seat, and we'll all partake together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for devising a plan, a method, so that we could be reconciled back to you. God, I don't understand how you could love us that much, but I'm thankful that you do. That you want us with you. That you devised a way so that our sins could be forgiven and we could spend eternity with you. God, help us not only this morning to remember that as we go through this memorial, but God help our life to be a living example of our gratitude for the sacrifice you made for us. 
We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may come forward. Thank you, Daniel. The words to that song, the chorus, includes, kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there is just something about that name. That name is Jesus. We need to remember that. And as we go about our daily life, remember Jesus. And as you take this bread this morning, Remember that Jesus said to his disciples then and through time to us, this represents my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He looked at his disciples and said, this cup represents my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our offering box is in the back. We appreciate the generosity and continued faithfulness of each one of you here at Central Christian Church. Appreciate the elders coming up and praying with me and anointing me. And I do believe what the Bible says. And the Bible says, if anyone's sick, as Bob said, let them call the elders and they can come and anoint you with oil and pray over you. And I echo Bob's comment that if any of you ever need that, if you're dealing with something in your life that you would like the elders to anoint you and pray over you, call one of us. We'll make that happen. Claim the Bible. Believe what the Bible says. And then just do it that way. It makes life a whole lot easier. Again, let me assure you, as far as I know, um, I'm not on death's door. Um, I look around this room, and I know many of you have a whole lot more aches and pains and problems than I do, and you deal with them all the time. We need to pray for each other more. We need to be aware that there are a lot of people in our congregation, a lot of people you know that aren't in this congregation, who struggle with things every single day. Don't forget them. Don't ignore them. Don't just think about them on Sunday when somebody mentions their name. Pray for them. Reach out to them throughout the week. Any other announcements? Anything else someone needs to say? Let's close with a prayer then. We'll be dismissed.
Father God, again, we thank you that you have a plan to save us. Thank you, Father, that for each one of us in this building, that plan's been revealed. And we have the opportunity, Father, to claim it. To become born of God, as we studied in Bible class this morning. Accepted into your family. God, we appreciate that. Help us to rejoice in that. Help us as we leave this building to remember church is not here. Church is us. And help us to be the light of those we come in contact with throughout our life. But I, I would ask that you be with Casey and Julie as they're traveling this weekend. I pray that you would keep them safe tomorrow as they come back home. Uh, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, church. Oh, wait, Bob? You want to do it now? Okay. Amy has asked if the elders would anoint and pray over her, so we're going to do that. If you need to leave and want to get up now and leave, feel free to do so. If you want to hang around here for a minute, we'll do Amy as well. Let me just... Say, that's cool, Amy. Paul, come join us. <laughs> Did you just quit? <laughs> Paul's over there talking to Emily. Most of you know Amy's been going through all kinds of health problems for quite a while. and So we're going to anoint her with this oil. We're going to pray over her. Every one of us knows there's no magic in this oil. This is not whoopee water. It doesn't have some special healing property. It's only valuable because we're doing what God wants us to do. I believe in prayer. I've watched it work in Debbie's life for 20 years. And it's been great. The elders anointed Debbie long, long ago. And instead of being gone in three to six years like they first told her, she's still here taking care of me 20 years later. And I'm thankful for that. We are too. Amy, we anoint you with oil. Honoring God's word. That if someone was ill and someone needs the prayers of the congregation, that they should call for the eldership and that they would anoint you and pray over you. So, Father God, we pray for Amy. Mm -hmm. We pray, God, for the problem she's been having, for the cancer she's contracted, and for the other pain and issues that she's been dealing with. Mm -hmm. And, God, we ask for her healing. We ask you to remove all of that from her. Yes. That you just help her body to function the way it's designed to function. Before sin came into the world and created all the problems we deal with, God, you created us perfect. So I pray for Amy. I pray that you heal her of the cancer. I pray that you take away the pain that she's been struggling with and that you just let her praise you for seeing you work in her life. Thank you for what you can do for her in Jesus' name. Dear Father God, I echo Bob's prayer, Lord, and I, I thank you for Amy being part of our family. Lord, I thank you that she's not given up. She's not bowed down to this cancer, Lord. Yes. Lord, cancer is evil, God. But when you created us, you said it was very good. Lord, we were created in your image. And God, I just pray that you would touch Amy. I pray that you would remove this cancer, Lord, either through your miraculous healing or, Lord, that you'll use the doctors and the medicines that they have out there to treat it and remove it that way, Lord, that it would go in remission and it would never come back, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you will touch her. I pray that she feels your presence, just not on Sundays, just not on Wednesdays, but, Lord, I pray that she feels you every single minute of her day that your peace and comfort comes over her in a mighty way, Lord. Lord, I just pray that she will see you working in her life, that this cancer will go away, 
and she can be a walking testimony for you, Lord, that you did a healing in her body, God. I know you're able, Lord, but Lord, I pray for your will to be done. Whatever you see that may be, through the doctors healing her, through the medicines, or you touching her and just removing it all together, Lord. We thank you for Amy. We thank you for the love she has for you. We thank you for the love she has for her church family, Lord. And we give you all the praise, all the glory for everything you're going to do in her life. I thank you for your son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father and Holy Son, Lord, you are the great physician, and I once again ask for your healing, your comfort, your peace, your grace, your love. To touch Amy, heal her body, heal her pain. Lord, as John said, help her to be a walking miracle, Lord, that, that she can testify to others of your strength and your grace and your love. Lord, we, we pray for this for her. We've been praying for some time now, Lord, and, and we, we ask again for your healing for Amy, Lord. We know you can do it. We know it's in your power. We pray it's in your will. But your will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, I agree. And, and Lord, I ask that uh, you would be with, be with Amy when, uh, when, when, in those times when she's afraid. God, give her, give her strength. God, when, uh, when, she's, uh, when she's down and discouraged, God, lift her up. God, when she's, uh, when she's feeling pain, Lord, that uh, she doesn't think that she can uh, take anymore. God, give her, give her peace, give her comfort, give her the strength to endure, Lord, the perseverance that she needs. God, strengthen her faith throughout this process, I pray, that she would look to you for the healing. Oh, God, I thank you that she's come forward in faith and ask that, that we would, uh, would pray over her, Lord, and All on that, uh, that that your word this morning, and I ask that that you would heal her, Father. Father, thank you for Amy. Thank you for her love. Thank you for her boldness to come forward. Uh, thank you for her faith, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for sending Amos to us. She is a good example of following your word. She is good to all of the rest of us. A very friendly person. You've given her the personality to reach out to others. We ask that others reach out to her, the doctors, be able to find a cure and help her and give her help to her and her family. We do appreciate all that you've given at, at, at this point in time, but we do ask you to do help us in the future. We know that you can help cure her and take care of her, but we do thank you for all that you have done. Amen. Let's repeat that anybody who would like to have this done, call one of us. We'll arrange it for you. You don't have to do it on Sunday morning. We can do it any time. Just let us know. And with that, let me just close this one more time. God, again, we thank you for the love we see in this room, for the love that you have for us. God, I do, again, just ask for Amy and for all those that we've mentioned this morning. God, we praise your wisdom and guidance as we follow you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be blessed, church. Thank you.